Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is why suicide terrorism. So the big question for today's lecture is why use suicide tactics and not other tactics? If you're the leader of a terrorist organization, why do you tell one of your devoted followers to go kill himself rather than have that devoted follower conduct a different sort of attack, survive, and be able to conduct more attacks into the future? Well, we're going to see three different explanations for this today. We're going to talk about the strategic benefits of suicide terrorism, the types of messages that suicide terrorism signals to other parties, and the outbidding process. I want to start up top with the strategic benefits because I think this is the most obvious. As a terrorist organization, unsurprisingly, your goal is to wreak as much havoc as humanly possible. And so given those goals, the 9-11 terrorist attack is probably the best terrorist attack in the history of mankind from your perspective. And of course, from a normal perspective, it's the worst terrorist attack in the history of mankind. Now, I want you to pretend like you're a terrorist and the leader of a terrorist organization, and you want to plan the destruction of these buildings. How do you go about doing that? Well, we know from history, what you do is you get a couple of planes, you hijack them, and you fly them straight into these buildings. They explode on impact. All of that jet fuel sets on fire. The buildings eventually cave in and fall to the ground. Now, how do you conduct that sort of attack, given that you want to destroy these buildings? How do you do that without having your guys die? Well, I guess one way you might be able to do that is to have them have parachutes and jump out of the plane and float safely to the ground right before the planes actually crash into the building. But that seems a little bit implausible and a little bit difficult to do, so that's probably not a realistic option. Another option might be to bomb the place in a more traditional way, to like essentially drive a van full of explosives into the building and have it sit there and then run away and have the bomb explode a few minutes later. But in fact, they tried that in 1993. There was the World Trade Center bombing. It didn't work. The World Trade Center survived and would survive until 2001 when the 9-11 terrorist attacks happened. So the point here is that as a suicide terrorist, you, you can actually do things that a non-suicide terrorist would not be able to do. So there are strategic benefits to choosing suicide terrorism. It allows you to conduct attacks which would not be possible otherwise. So that's the strategic benefit of suicide terrorism. Suicide terrorism also allows you to signal things. So unlike say, Al-Qaeda, some terrorist groups actually have realistic goals. Al-Qaeda's political goals are essentially unobtainable, but this is not true for most terrorist organizations. So, for example, the Tamil Tigers are probably the kings and queens of suicide terrorism. They've conducted more suicide terrorist attacks than any other organization in the history of the world, as far as we know. These guys were very good at what they did. And they actually had political goals. They were an ethnic group in Sri Lanka that wanted a, an ethnically Tamil separatist state in Sri Lanka. So that's an obtainable goal. This is something that they could have actually realistically obtained. Of course, we know from history that they ultimately failed and were militarily defeated by the Sri Lankan government. But nevertheless, hey, this is something that was actually obtainable, unlike what Al-Qaeda wants. So given that we have obtainable goals, why do we have conflict in the first place? We know from the unit on war that war is costly. Why don't we just come up with agreements that are mutually preferable to war? One of the answers that we talked about in that rationality of war unit is that there might be private information, there might be incomplete information, and if we knew everyone's resolve, the, how much they cared about the particular issues and how likely they were to win, we would actually be able to negotiate things properly. Well, that might not be the case. We might not have complete information. I might be uncertain about how resolved you are. And so if that's the case, one of the ways that we can fix this information problem and actually allow me to get the settlement that I want, if I really want a separate estate, if I conduct these terrorist attacks, what that conveys to the other side is how committed my people are to the particular issue. I want to convince you that the more you fight me, the more it's just not going to work. We're going to continue having suicide attacks. We're going to continue having attackers fight you all day, all night, every day for the rest of time until you give up. And if I can signal that message to you, that's going to compel you to want to lay down because, hey, it's just not worth the effort to continue doing this. Well, how do you convey how resolved, how committed you are to the particular issue? One of the best ways of doing that is to kill yourself. Right? Suicide terrorism conveys this message that we care so much about this issue that we're willing to blow ourselves up, so you should just give up. And this is the type of signal that you really don't get in a way if you don't have a suicide attack. So suicide attacks convey much more resolve than non-suicide attacks do. So there's a good signaling, a strong signaling mechanism here that you can use with suicide terrorism that you can't otherwise. And then the last 
explanation for suicide terrorism's outbidding. And this is a really interesting one that's probably not intuitive, and especially if you live in the West. In the West, we tend to focus on the relationship between just Al-Qaeda and the United States. What we forget is that terrorist groups actually have two audiences. There's the enemy, so if you're Al-Qaeda, the enemy is the United States. And then there's also this other enemy, the competing groups. As a terrorist organization, you want to be the terrorist organization on the block. In order to survive as an organization, you need to have money and you need to have followers. And if you have competition in suicide terrorism or in terrorism in general, you're going to run into problems. You want to be able to shut down your competition and be the one and only suicide terrorist group or just terrorist group in general on the planet or in the particular region because that's what's going to get you the most followers. It's what's going to get you the most money. And if you're a leader of a terrorist organization, both of those things are very important to you. So how do you put these other guys out of business? How do you get the money directed toward you? How do you get the followers directed toward you? Well, the best way of doing that is just to be the flashiest terrorist group out there, conduct the most vicious attacks, conduct the strongest attacks, and get all of those people over onto your side. So this is interesting because part of what compels terrorists to do these sorts of attacks that are really flashy is to put the other guys out of business. And this explains why whenever you see a terrorist attack happen, turn on the news, you'll have 8,000 different organizations claiming responsibility for the attack. The reason that they're doing that is because they want to be known as the group that conducted this particular attack because that's going to drive more interest in them from a potential suicide attacker or a potential terrorist in general. It's going to drive more money to them, and that's good for them as the organization. It's bad for the enemy state, the guy who's actually getting the guys blown up. But hey, as a terrorist organization, that's really not a concern for you. That's something you want to do. You want to be able to destroy other people. So suicide terrorists actually have some sort of method to their madness, especially the organizations that get these guys to go ahead and do that. And we talked about the three reasons why that might be the case here. So that actually wraps up this lecture, but this gives us a good starting point for the next lecture. In the next lecture, we want to talk about how you actually convince these guys to stop attacking you, right? That's the ultimate goal is that we'd want suicide terrorism. We want terrorism in general to stop. How do you go about doing that? Well, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time. Take care.